Okay. So we wanted to hop on here today because, and we wanted to share this with you because Kirsty and I have never sat down and actually had a conversation face to face with each other. And what you might not know is that we are both in Texas. So I guess technically we are both competitors of each other, but we're really different from each other with what we do. But I thought that maybe it would be fun to hop on and just share a little bit about both of our journeys and our stories and what we do, how we do them differently, and how that allows us to be in the same market, but also not really have to compete with each other because we are unique in what we do and stuff. Do you want to go first sharing what you do, your business model and kind of stuff, and then I'll share my business model? Sure. So there's like always the jihad debate about the ends of the spectrum and then you and I are pretty far opposite we are the spectrum which is really cool so I'm excited to talk about today yeah so I own an equine portrait photography business outside of Dallas Texas named Kirsten Marie Photography and the way that I have structured my pricing is what I consider to be all-inclusive so I have four packages that Every single package includes all the high resolution images that are completely edited and solely released for personal use. A wooden box, a four by six proof prints. So every image is released online, is printed in the box, and then also has a USB. And so then the three packages on top of the lowest also include a print credit so that people can order albums, prints, canvases calendars, whatever their heart desires. But what the reason I consider that all inclusive is because for one single price that they pick before the session, select before the session, they receive the high resolution files that are released and a printed version of each of it. So that's how I've structured my packages and the products and services inside of it. Yeah, I love that. I, at one point in time, I actually did something similar. So that is really interesting. Now that you were saying all of that, I was thinking to myself, I did actually do that though a little bit differently at one point in time. So I am what you would call a pretty like strict IPS photographer. So I do in-person sales. My clients pay a session fee. The session fee covers my travel to them, my time photographing the session and a print credit. And so they get a big print credit that they can use towards their favorite portrait. But the difference is that they get to see their, all of their portraits after the session over Zoom. We go through them. We talk about which ones they love. Then they decide how they want to spend that print credit. And then they can spend more. So my clients are not getting all of their photos. They're just getting their favorites that they really love. And I am very hands-on in helping them pick and choose which ones are their favorites. And helping them design stuff and all of that good stuff. Because I struggle with that personally. So I love that like I can help them with that. And so, yeah, that's your basic true IPS photographer model. I would say the only difference is that I don't do IPS in person sales in person. I do it over Zoom. And I am not a high pressure salesperson either. <laughs> so low pressure virtual IPS, I guess, is what you would call my model. Awesome. Yeah, it's so I guess the next step was how did you get to the point that you decided to go all inclusive? Yeah. I didn't know of any other portrait photographers of a model similar to mine when I was starting out. But I can tell you that I had a very poor experience after college with a photographer where there just was a huge lack of communication about pricing, about what was included, about even what she offered in general. And so I, after that experience, just felt so misled, so ripped off, like that was not at all what I had expected. And then my next encounter being a consumer of photography was my wedding photographer. And the juxtaposition between those two was just enormous because I felt like the value of what I was receiving, even though I spent 10 times the amount, the value of what I was receiving just felt enormous. And I had this wedding photographer where it's very common in wedding photography to have more of an all-inclusive structure, right? I had the released images from him that were all edited and ready to go. 
and he included the proof prints in a wood box. So everything was printed. Everything was digital as well. And I just felt like I got everything that I wanted. I was thrilled. The whole experience was wonderful. After that, I had gone on our honeymoon, which was an all-inclusive vacation. And that was the first time I had ever vacationed all-inclusive as well. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is the greatest. You pay the fee and then you don't have to stress about anything afterwards. So it was honestly between my honeymoon and the wedding photography experience that I had, I was like, this is what I would love to deliver in a portrait photography format. There were certainly, I wasn't unique in that of offering all of the files. If you were to pick a few against each other, there's shoot and burn, which is typically like notoriously a very low price Mm -hmm. and releasing all of the files. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's the in-person sales, which is you're withholding the images and selling them individually after the session. And those are like the two pitted against each other. And and I, and I wouldn't have considered myself shoot and burn because of the entry price I was starting at. Like when I started my business with these all-inclusive packages, my lowest package was $995. And so that doesn't, that I didn't feel like that quite put me in the shoot and burn category, especially because I was considered, I was also delivering the proof print. So that's why I considered it not shoot and burn, but more like all-inclusive. And so with my lowest package being $995 and building up from there, I just created and not to say other photographers weren't doing that but I didn't know of any other portrait photographers doing that wedding photographers yes absolutely I structured my whole package system based off how wedding photography was consumed but portrait photographers I wasn't aware of anybody else doing it so I was like I felt like a pioneer of just being like I don't this is I think this can work and I think this is what the market has an appetite for because as a consumer this is what I like but honestly it was pretty untested and so I was the guinea pig of is this gonna work <laughs> how many years ago was that that you started your what? business the end of 2013 is when I opened my business okay cool I love that so it's funny because you and I had completely polar opposite experiences yeah. because the reason that I decided I love the IPS model and I loved like selling albums and having my clients like sit down with me and sort through their photos. After I got out of college, I had started my business my last semester in college. So that was 2012. Oh, oops, my AirPod died. <laughs> so I started my business right after I got out of college. And I knew I was doing like all the digital files included thing at first. And I thought I was going to sell wall art, but I didn't know how to do it. I was trying and I was like stumbling through this weird process really half-hazardly. And uh, I hired a photographer to do my boudoir photos. And it was amazing. I loved every second of it. I remember going into her studio. First of all, I remember finding her on Instagram, which was like early days of Instagram. (laughs) And I found her work and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. We were sitting at Chili's eating dinner and I was like trying to fade it for my husband what I was looking at so he didn't know. And I contacted her. I was like, I want to do boudoir photos with you. And I booked a session, went to her studio, sat down for the information meeting before I booked. She asked me about myself. She asked me about what I liked about my body, what I didn't like about my body. She like was so excited. She like acted like she was my best friend that I never knew I had. She went through so many things. She showed me all the products. She told me how much they cost. She said, this is what most people buy. And I was like, oh my gosh, that album is so pretty, but there's no way I'm going to spend thousands of dollars on an album. I just graduated from college. I'm trying to start my business. We are paying for our own wedding. I am broke. There's no way. And I went through the process and did the session, was trying on all these lingerie things, texting her photos, just giving me advice. And It was just amazing. Did the session, loved it. It was the most fun experience ever. Like I still to this day remember the way it made me feel. Then sit down and seeing the photos and being like, oh my gosh, I love this. I love all of these so much. How would I ever decide what to do with them? And 
I was so grateful for the fact that she was there to guide me along in the process. And then the realization of, oh my gosh, I love them all so much. I have to do that album. I don't care how much it costs because it is that beautiful and I need all of these photos. And being so excited to spend the money and being so proud of myself that I was able to somehow save thousands of dollars secretly and hide it from my soon-to-be husband (laughs) and buy him this gift. Like it just made it that much better. And it was truly amazing for me. So I quickly discovered that's what I wanted to do in my business. And I didn't really know how to do it. And again, one day I'm sitting on Facebook and I see this random post come up for this photographer that was offering like a one-on-one coaching program to teach how to do sales and sell wall art. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I can pay for this, but I'm going to sign up. (laughs) And I did. And I signed up for this program and she helped introduce me to the idea of in-person sales. And like my prices were so low back then compared to what they are now. Like I was selling like $35 prints and I thought that was like so much money and I was freaking out and my canvases were like $300 for a giant canvas and it felt like so much money. It was back then it felt like it. And over the years, that's changed. But I'll also add, I started out doing weddings and newborns. And actually, before I had my own business, I worked for a livestock photographer. Fun facts, most people don't know about me. But so I did weddings and I did newborns. So I've done the wedding photography pricing and I've done it. I have tried every pricing model there was. When I was a wedding photographer, there was a time when my husband was like, if you change your pricing one more time, Corinda, this is ridiculous. I would just try different methods because I was convinced that like the next one that somebody taught was going to be the best. And the next one that somebody else taught was going to be the best. And I got into the vicious cycle of I would go to a workshop or a conference and I'd hear something. I'd be like, that's so cool. I want to try it. And I would completely reinvent the wheel. And I would get an inquiry one day and try this pricing model and an inquiry the next day. And I would try this pricing model. Like I was crazy. And it drove my husband insane. (laughs) We had this joke for a long time about it. So I did that in the wedding photography world. And then in my newborn world, I also tried and experimented quite a bit. Probably not as much as I did with my wedding pricing. Um, But I played around a lot with different things in the early years. And I ended up essentially taking a lot of pieces of what a lot of really great educators that I had learned from or mentors that I had hired, bits and pieces of what they taught me and putting them into something that I believed in and really worked for me, which was I want all of my clients to have an album. That was really important. And I wanted them to have at least something on their wall. And for me, I was like, I don't need them to have all the pictures of themselves because I would sit there and glaze over staring at pictures of myself. So it's how I came upon where I'm at today with my pricing and it's something that I love and I'm passionate about just like you're so passionate about your pricing I'll also kind of share a funny story because I've never told you this so a long time ago I'm sure you probably remember I contacted you about doing photos like a long time ago like when I was first doing equine photography stuff I was like I need to hire somebody to do this with me And I reached out to you because I was like, you're the best. Of course, I'm going to hire her. And then you sent me your pricing. And I was like, I don't like pictures of myself. I don't want 100 pictures of myself in a box. Can I just? That was (laughs) And honestly, like, I looking back on it, I should have just done it. But like, it was one of my insecurities, not loving photos of myself and being that person. I just need a few of the really good ones because there's only a few pictures of me that I really love that stopped me from booking a session which I think is interesting because that's what makes us different right somebody who might be insecure about themselves and be like I don't need them all I don't love myself that much versus somebody that's oh my gosh I love photos of myself they're gonna go to you and I just told my husband the other day I was like I just need to do it I need to finally hire for to come take my photos and just suck up the fact that I don't like pictures of myself and just do it (laughs) so yeah that's my journey and how I got there so yeah, do you want to share what your, do you have a low end price that you're like, this is the minimum somebody can pay me or like an average or do you have people that come and buy lots of art and stuff using the system that you use? Okay, so that's a lot of questions. <laughs> I, one thing, one thing that I just like 
I wanted to piggyback off of what you said was that I always preach the more different we all are, the more we're going to succeed. And what you said about being passionate about what you're selling, we are the only salesperson in our business. Right. No, if you don't believe in what you're selling, like how are you going to be a successful salesperson? So I am very passionate, like as an educator to be like, I am never here to teach you my system. Right. I am not here to replicate myself. I am, I do not want to go and create clones. Like, and none of my courses are how to copy myself at all. It's all about how to find, like how to tap into your superpower and how to find what your heart and your passion is trying to say. Because the more different that we all are, you and I are going to attract a very different set of people. And I think that's important. I don't think that one business model should be all the things to all the people. I don't think you should have a thousand different pricing strategies so that you can cater to every single segment of this market. I think that you should hone into what you're very passionate about, like you just did, and then give your clients the best experience ever, which is what you do, and which is why I have so much immense respect for what you do and who you are and the business that you offer within this industry. So back to the questions that you were firing at me. (laughs) So when I go through spreadsheets of the cost of how I do business Hmm. and the minimum amounts that I need to charge to be able to take home the salary that I want to, the minimums I am currently at is about $1,500. So with that, my lowest package is $1,895 currently. And that is only for local sessions. If I'm going to travel at all, you're pushed into my top three packages. So I only offer my lowest session to start at 1895 for people who are local to me. If it's any type of travel, in addition to the travel fee, they're, ha- they're going to have to go with a higher package. My average spend this year was over $3,100 per client. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the print credit that I offer, people can purchase print through the online gallery that I delivered through. And all of that is, I don't have it self-fulfilled. I have it auto-fulfilled. So all right. of that is just create my lab. Or more commonly, I am holding their hands through the process. Typically, it's just over email though. So they'll let me know what they're considering. I'll mock up a whole bunch of different options. So mm-hmm. If they want XYZ as wall art, I mock that up digitally. I send that to them. It can be on a stock wall or they'll send me a picture of their wall. I'll mock all that up. I'll send that to them. So I regularly have wall art sales, album sales. I design all the albums. They just mark their favorite images that they want in there. So it is a really big misconception. I feel like that once you offer the digital file, you've lost the rest of the sale. That's what what screamed to me on the internet <laughs> over and over when you get into these heated debates about true <laughs> model is that you lost the sale after you yes. the high resolution file. And since 2013, I just, I just personally have never found that to be true. My highest sales, I have a lot of repeat clients. So my highest like individual sale from one portrait session is over $7,000. I regularly have it, I, my average is 3100 but the, I regularly have five to $7,000 sales from an individual portrait session when they're adding wall art and albums. Yes, they have the high-resolution file. Yes, they can go to Costco or Mint Dates or Artifact Uprising or anything like that. They can go do it themselves. But if they would like my help, I love to help them through that process, through selecting, getting the galleries and everything like that. Did I answer all of your questions? I yeah, forget. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll share my flip side of that. So yeah. I have my minimum. So my minimum spend is like around $1,100 plus my session fee part. So it's around like $1,350 is my minimum spend. That's my place where like somebody wants to come work with me. They're on a budget. I think that they can come work with me for around $1,350 all in. They can walk away with a smaller set of images without wall art, just small prints and digitals, and they'll be happy with that. I would say my most common sale is like the four to $5,000 range. And sometimes I do have clients that spend upwards of 10. I've had a $20,000 client, but those are anomalies to some extent, right? Not everybody's going to spend $20,000 on portraits. 
I'll also say probably one of the difference is too in the amount of our sales, I would assume has to do with the products too. Because if you're fulfilling through your lab, you're probably selling like your traditional canvas is and things like that. Whereas I'm selling a premium guild canvas, which is much more expensive, which means I'm selling a lot. My prices on my canvases are probably much higher than what you're selling in your galleries. So I would assume if we looked at what we were selling, we would actually probably be selling about the same. Most of my clients are buying an album and they're getting wall art of some sort. And that gets them to that $5,000 range. So I bet if we compared like really apples to apples, we were walking away the same way. So yeah, that's my average there and what most of my clients do. But I love this point about the digital file thing. I think that you totally can give the digital files away for the right price, (laughs) I should say. And you can still have clients that want to buy art from you. And you just have to offer the experience to them and offer the process to them. Like one of my coaching clients, she just had a client that got all their digital files and then she went and sold like $14,000 of stuff. They bought like multiple albums and multiple huge pieces of wallet for multiple rooms. And it was like one of her first experiences like selling wall art to anybody. And she was like, holy crap, this is amazing. I was like, wow, you got lucky. Like one of your first times around, that was really cool. It doesn't happen all the time, but good for you. And I think that was a really cool example of digital files don't really mean that they're not going to buy art from you. So that's a really cool point there. Yeah. Do you have any questions about what I do with that? Okay, I do. I'm curious about how long is your session? How many images will you take? And then how many images are you showing them? Average, how many images are they purchasing? Yeah, so my sessions... Yeah, you know what I mean? So my sessions are 90 minutes. 90 minutes. I am an overshooter. I typically am there for two hours. That's for a traditional outdoor portrait session. Like my black backgrounds are... 30 minute sessions, I normally shoot them in about really 15 minutes. So let's talk about outdoor sessions. So a typical outdoor session, 90 minutes, technically, like I said, I'm there for about two hours. Two different looks is all I do. Um, I'm showing them typically 70 to 80 photos if they only have one horse and it's one person. If it's multiple people, multiple horses, sometimes I'll push that 100 to 120 mark, depending on how many people and how many horses. So I think I've, that's a lot more than a lot of IPS photographers. Do you think that's yes. because it's in there and because it really changes the dynamic of the image, like posing wise? Yeah. So I'm a overshooter, <laughs> like really yeah. bad overshooter. I'm big like flow posing and overshooting is my thing. <laughs> and same, and same. I just feel like a lot of IPS yeah. photographers I'm familiar with show like thirty to forty of yes. the old or like even try to pare it down like farther than that. Yeah. So I guess I'm just like surprised like that you would leaf through 80 to 100 pictures over Zoom. Yeah, I do. And it only takes like maybe 15, 20 minutes to get through all of them. It doesn't take a long time. I have a really good process. So I typically find clients love about 30% of what they see. So typically the first pass through about 30% of what they see will end up in their love pile. Sometimes I end up with those clients that love like 60, 70, 80 in that range, but those are my bigger sessions. So I typically consider that I'm going to sell about 30% of what I show them. And most of the time, that's also how I sell so many albums because I'm selling albums because I'm showing such a variety of photos that people really can't part with all of them. So it's easier to sell an album when you're showing a variety. If I was only showing like 30, 40 photos, It would be easy. Need all of them in the album. (laughs) Either get all of them in the album or cut them down and not end up with an album. So that's why I sell so many albums. But I would say about 30% of what I show people typically buy. Most of my clients get an album with about 40 of their favorite portraits in it. And then sometimes I have the 60, 70 in an album kind of people, but those are normally multiple horses and multiple people. And then my albums start with 25. So 25 is kind of like the low end. And then normally I'm selling at least three. For how many spreads would 25 pictures be? 25 images. So I, my albums are super simple. So I either put one or two images on a spread. So it's about, I don't know, it depends on the session. 
So about 15 spreads normally okay. is the bare minimum. So yeah, I I sell a lot of albums because I show so many photos. I think it's harder to sell albums and like image boxes if you're not shooting a lot. But I don't think you have to like, call images. I hate calling too, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I shoot, I shoot like a thousand images in a session and I call them down to a like hundred. So I like am really bad at overshooting. So yeah, that's how I do it. For my fine art, like my white or black backgrounds, typically I am showing 20 to 25 images for those um, per horse. And normally I'm selling one big statement piece of art or multiple pieces of art. I'll sell albums if the people have multiple horses because they'll get like an album with a few photos of each horse. But typically I'm selling wall art. And those sessions this year, I'm sitting at like around a $3,000 average for wall art sales. But $3,000 is just one really big guild canvas. <laughs> so keep that in mind too, because guilds are so expensive, right? So that's a little bit of a thing to keep in mind when people are saying, when you hear photographers saying they have like huge giant sales, they're the not having huge, very greatly. Yeah. Yeah. They're not having huge giant sales because they're offering like CG pros, cheap canvases. They're having yeah. huge giant sales because they're offering like really high-end expensive luxury product lines which they can charge more money from so if you're sitting there thinking i can't even add up my canvases to make a five thousand dollar sale it's because you're not offering like one of the higher end lines yeah absolutely okay i it i my session links vary by the package that you get my whole session length is an hour and then it goes up to three hours. I shoot probably about 1,500 images in an hour session, up to 2,500 images if it's a three hour session. And then after calling down that, what I would deliver is probably about 100 images in an hour, up to about two, 250 images for a three hour session. My shooting versus delivering. So, when you say you overshoot, I, I understand. <laughs> like you make me not feel like an overshooter. So thanks for that. I go into every single session with the sole goal of shooting less. And all I do is shoot more. Like every, I feel like every single time, all I do is shoot more. I mean, like, I'm gonna shoot less. I'm going to shoot less. I have to shoot less. Do you so shoot good. film still? You used to shoot some film, right? You I don't. Used to, I used to be exclusively. I started How 100% film. How can you used to have been a film shooter and you're an overshooter? <laughs> yeah, I think that's why. I, I, I legitimately think my insecurity from missing shots or restricting my shots back like when I was filmed mm -hmm. um, is why I overshoot so badly now. Because I'm like, oh, if I lay on the shutter, I'm going to get the shot and then I won't have to Photoshop it. Like, I won't have to face swap. I won't have to swap ears. <laughs> that's so funny. Good I have more pulling to do, but then I have less time to retouch. <laughs> when I shot weddings, because the first like half of my like first five years of my business was wedding and newborns, I learned how to shoot film because that's what you do when you're wedding photographer. You want to learn how to shoot film. So you have those pretty grainy, airy photos. And I was like, this is going to make me better at not overshooting. No, it didn't help at no, all. No, I swear it made me worse. <laughs> that's so funny. I love that. Have you ever, did you start out shooting horses or did you shoot other things in the beginning? I started with horses and I never, Amazing. I never landed on anything else. No, I, uh, I bought myself a camera for Christmas in 2011 and I went out to my parents' front pasture and practiced on the horses. And then it, I started asking my friends to model for me with their horses and horses were the only thing worth capturing to me like it's the only it's the only story i wanted to tell was the love between a girl and her horse right the only thing that inspired me and so i never delved into anything else now i worked for a wedding and portrait photographer and so i second and third shot for her a lot and i assisted her a lot on weddings was like yeah i never want to do this <laughs> and i would assist her on the newborn shoots and was like yeah i never want to do this and other things like that. So I got experience, not firsthand, but I think even better was secondhand 
being able to see it without the pressure being on you and realize quickly that was not for me. I'm like, all I care about is girls and horses. So that's what I started with. And that's what I've stayed with since day one. That's amazing. I learned how to use my camera. I was working student at a barn and I was bored while I was waiting to like tack new horses up. So I found this camera and I started using it. And that's how I learned how to take photos. And then it was like, oh, you want to do weddings? You should do babies. That's just what happened because that's what people assume you do. There's such a big market for it. It's well, such a, I, I swear to God, if I got a dollar for every wedding in Korea, I get it. Yeah, it's field. I'm sure wedding photography is not an easy industry, but my goodness, the amount of inquiries I get for weddings, I'm like, I need an associate photographer to just to do my wedding, so that I just don't show up. It's a great (laughs) idea. I like that's my next business venture. (laughs) That's so funny. I I look all the weddings and hire them. (laughs) I'm glad I shot weddings and like people by themselves before I added horses into the equation, though, because. Now I go to pose people by themselves without a horse. And I'm like, this is so hard. What do I do with their hands? There's nothing for them to touch or hold on to. And I'm like, how did I used to do like a two hour long bridal portrait session of a girl in a dress holding a bouquet and a veil? That was really hard. I have to be really creative. <laughs> now it's just, okay, you're a horse. So yeah, I'm glad I had that piece of the journey. And the other thing too is that when I decided I wanted to switch over to equine photography, I literally went to Kentucky. I was there and I literally was like, I'm going to start doing equine photography again. That's where I learned to use my camera. Why am I doing that? It's so stupid. I stayed up all night long. I built my website and I was like, I'm doing this. I'm going to be an equine photographer. And then I was like, crap, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I know how many years it took for me to get really good at like weddings and babies. And I was like, how do I get good at this? So that's when I was like, I'm going to photograph 365 horses this year, like literally sitting in a hotel room in the middle of Kentucky. I'm going to do this. And this is what I'm going to do. So whenever I started my equine photography brand, I was like, where do I want my place to be in the market? And this involves you and you've never heard this story. So this is a fun story to tell with you on the cure. I remember like researching all the other equine photographers who is out there? What are they doing? And of course, I found you. And I was like, okay, there's this person. She's really popular. I can tell she's really good at what she's doing. And I was like, I don't want to compete with her. I don't want to do what she's doing. I need to do it differently. So I purposefully, when I launched my brand, I stayed really far away from your lane and what you were doing because I didn't want to have to compete with you. I was like, she's shooting all these quarter horses and all AQHA people. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go in that lane. I'm going to find the hunter jumper people. I want to go there. That's my people. That's where I came from. It's an easy path to go. And I also remember like looking at like, okay, I knew that I didn't. I was like, I don't want to dress my clients like she's dressing her clients. I want to do something different. My clients are going to wear ball gowns. And I was like, I'm going to put them in these giant ball gowns. I'm going to rent these dresses for Rent the Runway. And this is how I'm going to build my portfolio here with these giant Rent the Runway ball gowns. And I purposely saw what you were doing and was like, how do I be, how am I different and how can I make myself different and stand apart from what she's doing and stand true to what I believe in and not come into the market and be like, I'm going after what she's doing. I want to copy what she's doing. And I think that's so important because I talk to people all the time that are like doing this and doing this, doing this. And I'm like, that's great. Be aware of what people are doing for a hot second. Make sure that you're not copying them. Make sure that you're not shooting in the same clothes. Your clients, you're not dressing them the same. You are not doing the same, going after the same like group of people. Make sure that your pricing is different. Make sure that your experience is different. Make sure that those things are different, but they're true to yourself. And that allows the two of us to have different clients and be in the same market and still be okay with the fact that there's plenty of people for both of us because we're different. So I just remember like looking at yourself and being like, I, there's no way I'm not going to try to photograph quarter horses. Like she does that. I'll give her all those people and I'll find something else to do. And like, I, there's another photographer in Texas that does some of the same stuff that I do event wise and their style is totally different. Like they dress their clients in breeches and show shirts. And their photos are a lot in black and white. 
we can be next to each other and we can be at the same events. And I can be okay with that knowing that her clients that want to put on breeches and a show shirt are going to go to her. And my clients that want to put on a ball gown and glitter are going to come to me. And there's room for both of us. And be okay in knowing that. So I think that's important to differentiate yourself and to know like you can be in the same market and not compete with each other at all. At all. I don't know if you've felt that experience with anybody that's real close to you or local to you or you've seen that or had new people come in and try to knock off what you're doing. I'm sure people probably try that all the time because everybody knows you. There are, I think that's the smartest thing you could have done as a business owner. Right. As a business owner is to say, here's the current landscape of the market and here is the gap. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that I did entering this market. Nobody was doing what I wanted to do. There were a whole bunch of equine photographers who would show up at the farm call, photograph people all day long. So let's just talk about the quarter horse industry. They have a lot of advertising needs. They need high-resolution files to advertise, and they need a lot of images to do it. So these people would come up, and it would be like an eight-hour farm call, and they would go through the whole entire barn, all the people, all the horses. And it was just like a cattle call, like one after the other, right? Mm -hmm. Get all the pictures done. And that was the current landscape of that market. And I was like, I, that is so impersonal. I want to be best friends with the person in front of my lens. I want an intimate experience. I want them to feel like this is the best day of their life. So I only book one person a day and they have my full undivided attention. I will not, I'm not going to sit there for eight hours and just person after person drag them through in front of my lens. Like, I want the whole day to be about them. I want them to have the best light. I want them to have my undivided attention. And I genuinely want to get to know them through this process and maintain a relationship with them years afterwards. So when I entered the market and there were a whole bunch of equine photographers, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to come in at the top price point saying this is a once in a lifetime experience. Mm -hmm saying this is a completely different experience than you've ever had with photography before. And I'm going to essentially be as different as I can from the photographers that are there right now. And so it's the same thing you just described doing. We just landed on different ends of the spectrum. And it's the exact same thing with pricing. You and I went in applying the same formula of what we're passionate about and our past experiences driving our own business model. And we just landed on two opposite ends of the spectrum. It's the same process that just got us in very different destinations. And so that's how I entered the market was like, this is going to be my corner. I think there's a corner for storytelling. Mm-hmm. And about this being a, a really big production from what has currently happened in that landscape. But what I think is so interesting is I overlap considerably with a lot of photographers in my area, meaning we share clients nonstop. Mm-hmm. They'll come to me, they'll go to them, they'll come to me, they'll go to them. They have a lot of needs for photography because of the industry that we're in. And we did what one thing I love about equine photography is that we're not mutually exclusive. Meaning, if it were a wedding photographer, yeah, one wedding photographer <laughs> wins the wedding and the You're rest will lose that wedding. They're very mutually exclusive. Oh. But she can book me this year and someone else next year and a different person the year after that and then come back to me if she wants to, blah, blah, blah. So, what one thing I've noticed significantly is there's a really strong tend to choose other photographers. And then when it comes to senior pictures, they choose me and then they go back to other photographers. That Mm -hmm. is one thing I've noticed um, in the industry. But I'll say what you did in cornering your own section of the market is you and I have virtually zero overlapping clients. Whereas I have a ton of overlap with other photographers Mm -hmm. where we swap clients left and right. And it's like a revolving door of people hiring this person, that person, and the other person. I feel like where you and I are such opposite ends of the spectrum on so many levels is that we are never in the same actual market of clients. Yeah. And it's it's not even pricing. It doesn't all come down to this pricing thing no. either. A lot of it comes down to if my like I I've never even asked you this question and I'm just making an assumption here. If 
somebody wants to look fierce and they want to put on look like a fierce supermodel with their horse and they want to be like posed to perfection and like literally look like they came off like the runway at the NFR or something, they're going to go to you and they're going to look amazing and fierce with their pony. If somebody wants to like put on a ball gown and go skip around in the pasture and giggle and not be perfect and not be posed fiercely, they're going to come to me because our shooting style is so different too. And maybe that was a little bit of an overreach with (laughs) how I explained your style. But um, like I see your clients and I'm like, oh my gosh, my clients could never dress like that. I wish I could get people to dress like that. That looks like fun. but That's just not who I am. And therefore I don't get those clients. So I think that's cool there. The other thing I'll share is that I have a coaching client that lives in the San Antonio area. So she's in Texas. And she contacted me and I know when she contacted me, she was thinking because she's told me since then, she was like, I don't know if Karina was going to coach me or not. And I don't know if she would take notice as a coaching client. And I was like, of course I would. Because I know that me taking you on as a coaching client, number one, I know that you're charging your worth. And I know that you're creating a business that's unique to you because I don't want to create cookie cutters. But also like through the process, like we created a unique style for her clients. Like she literally said to me at one point in time, She goes, I don't understand why somebody would want to put on a dress and go take pictures with their horse in like a dress or a ball gown or something. That's just not, doesn't speak to me. She goes, I have no idea why these photographers put their clients in dress in outfits like that. And I'm like, that's how I started my business and built it. It's evolved a little bit since then. And she goes, I want my clients in jeans and t-shirts and barefoot playing with their pony. And our Businesses are so different, even though we are competitors now. And our pricing is pretty similar. Our system is really similar. And so a funny story is that I did all these portraits at Pin Oak this year. And somebody I photographed at Pin Oak booked an outdoor portrait session with her this fall. And she's like, aha, I got one of your clients. And I'm like, that's okay. Because I know that person and I know you. And I know that person is wear jeans and hang out with their pony. And just be like a silly little kid barefoot out there in the field. And that's not what I do. And like I saw the girls' photos and I thought to myself, like, I could have never done that. I could have never pulled off what she pulled off to show that lady's like real true personality with her animals. And she did it flawlessly. And it gives me like a bit of a peace of knowing like there is room for everybody if we're all different. And we are all different. None of us are the same. So it's speaking to that, I think, is so important in our business. So I have a question. So people who are coming new into the market, because I get this question a lot as a coach, and they're like, I would love to be all inclusive and just be all inclusive and charge all the money up front and just give them all their digital files. But like, how do you do that when you're first starting out? For me, I always say, The reason I say like IPS is a kind of an easier way to start out and make money is because you have a lower barrier to entry. And then when people see the photos, they're going to fall in love and they can buy them. And you can even offer like all the digital files. Maybe they pay $500 up front and then afterwards they pay $1,500 and they get all the digital files and you still meet that goal of your income. So you can do that, but without having to get it all up front. How would you say people who are just starting out and going out and want to include all the digitals but don't want to charge $250 for all the digitals like what kind of advice do you give them to figure out the waters and getting your name out there and being able to charge the money up front the the only way I know how to do it is how I did it just because anything else is untested and I don't know right you know what I mean so I the only way that I can communicate that is that I didn't have a pressure to go full-time quickly. And I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. That was a great blessed situation where I had another full-time job that was very well-paying in the finance industry. And I built that up on the side until I was running two full-time jobs and I had to choose between the two. So it for me, it was a slow evolution. And I started at the beginning charging a profitable price. Like I said, right out of the gate, when I opened up my business, and by that point, I had spent two years practicing and building my portfolio before I started charging clients. And so I just think 
I think that's a longer timeline than a lot of people want. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's the only way I can like really recommend it is take the time to know your camera inside and out, to learn how to pose, to learn how to deal with different personalities, to learn how to photograph a difficult horse, to shoot in difficult weather situations. I mean, by the point I started my business and was ready to charge prices that were profitable right off the bat at the beginning was because I was confident that no matter what the situation was, I could deliver images that were at the level my portfolio was at, right? So even if it was tough weather, even if it was a tough horse, even if the person was super awkward, even if X, Y, Z, I had enough experience under my belt at that point, then I wasn't using my clients to practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes practice sense. Happen. The practice right. had already happened. Like I'd spent two years in the practice stage. And so in 2013, when I started my business and I made those packages and they were at a sustainable price point, it was like I, I was just ready to start the business as a professional, not as an amateur. I feel like so many people rush the hobby part of it and are like, oh, I'm going to make money doing this. And then, uh, but, and, and then it took me from 2013 to 2017 until I went full time. So then I spent the two years practicing before I became a business. And then I spent four years building the business up to a point close to being in 2017. So three years, three years building the business up to a point where it could replace the full-time income I was receiving elsewhere. So that's why I I don't have a get rich quick team in this. And I don't have, I think we all have the same distance to travel. I think education can be an accelerator to what you're learning, but I don't think there are shortcuts. I think we all have the same distance to travel. And I think you have a lot of sweat equity to put into this if you're going to make it work. From both the photography side and taking the pictures and from the business side. Like, I don't think that education is a shortcut by any means. I think you and I have the same distance. We got to travel. And education is an accelerator because you get to cruise past some of the mistakes a little quicker. Yeah. But I don't think it's a shortcut. And I don't think that there are shortcuts you can take in building a business. So that's my feelings about if you're going to start off the bat is all inclusive, you better be confident in the product and service that you're delivering and you Mm -hmm. better not be practicing on people. Does that make sense? Yeah. For sure. Practice, it should have already happened. So here is my, I'll share my take on it because it's completely different. So I 100% agree. You should not like take anybody's money and tell you not use your camera. Go take pictures. I always tell people Go take your hydro flask outside and practice taking pictures of your hydro flask in every lighting situation and every weather all over the place until you can take a gorgeous portrait of your hydro flask anywhere. Then you should consider taking pictures of a person and then maybe add a horse in because horses complicate things. It's much easier to learn on just a person. But the thing is, like, I'm a big believer in it's that weird situation in the beginning when you're learning and you're like, how do I learn and how do I practice? And I feel like so many people feel like when they're learning and practicing, that equates to giving away everything for free. And so what I, how I look at this is, you know what? Gift your time to somebody. Say, I would love to practice. I'll gift you a few photos. And then if they're really good and they love them, then offer to let them buy their files or something like that. So that way you don't have to work for free in the beginning, but you're also not like, totally running the industry and being the cheap photographer or giving everything away to everybody and then nobody wants to hire a real photographer. So that's my advice is like gift your time to them, take the photos, give them a few images and then have a price list. And even if it's an all inclusive price list, like even if it's like, a hey, I would love to donate a portion of my session fee. Plus, I'm going to gift you five images. By the way, if you love them, you can buy more. That's fine. If not, the five images, you'll love them anyway. So there's room to make money and be profitable while you're building your business as opposed to just doing it for free. Because it's that weird, like, how do you build a portfolio and not just, I don't know. Do you have 
that kind of weird, like, what do you do in the beginning? Do you give them all their files? Do you do it for free? Do you make money? Do you, are you upfront with it? There's this weird thing, I feel like. So that's always my recommendation is just give your time, give a little bit, and then allow them to buy more if they want it. If you're upfront and clear, I think that's the sneaky part, right? You have to be upfront and clear about everything or else it becomes sneaky. Yeah. I don't know. That's just my take on it. And that's the advice somebody gave me in the beginning. So, yeah. Do you know or do you mind sharing? Do you know what percentage of what comes in your business goes in your pocket? Are you running it like 50 percent goes in your pocket as like revenue and the other half is its cost and expenses? Or do you like know what that looks like for you? I haven't figured it out for this year. And the reason it gets a little bit confusing is as an escort, I pay myself a salary. And that's all a business expense. When I'm just looking at the profit margin straight into my like accounting system, my bookkeeping mm-hmm. system, and I'm looking at all of that numbers, it's like, okay, I maxed out my 401k contributions and that's all a business expense. Right. And I pay myself a salary and that's all a business expense. So I can't rattle off a like 2021's number to you, uh-huh. but in general, about 30 to 40% of top line revenue becomes put in the end. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I run at like 40% of everything I make and I'm a big believer in profit, the profit first method. I don't know if you've read the book, but yeah, I, I love profit. I love profit first. So anyways, 40% of what I make goes to me it's my personal money and then about 20 percent covers my cogs so my products that i sell and 20 percent covers my expenses is where i run at and then the rest is like taxes savings and stuff like that so it's always interesting to hear like some people are like running it like half and half some people are running it 30 30 30 it just it's always interesting to hear where people are there and i think it's helpful for people to know too i want to make a hundred thousand dollars in my pocket what does that realistically look like? And not thinking like in the beginning years when you're like, okay, cool. So if I can make $50,000 in my business and then you forget how much it costs to run your business. Well, yeah. No, the dollars in is not the dollars in your pocket. That that is it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, that's gonna, yeah, that was an eye-opening thing in the beginning. I was like, these people are crazy. There's no way that uh, it's going to cost this much to run a photography business. <laughs> And now I look at my bank account and want to cry. So I think this could be a fun topic to share. How do you like tell your clients the value and what they're getting from you? Do you email them? Do you call them on the phone? Do you have to work hard to sell them the value in that like spending a couple thousand dollars up front? Or is it easy for you? Okay. From the beginning, I always looked at my marketing as a long game. Mm -hmm. I knew I would never be able to instantly convert someone. Someone will not be able to look at my picture and book me the next day. So that was something I, from like the onset of my business, I was like, what I do today is getting me my clients three, four, five years from now. And I cannot emphasize how true that has become. I photographed three Seniors recently whose mothers went out of their way to call me, DM me, or pulled me aside at the session to say she has been dreaming of this. Thank you photographed XYZ model in 2015. 2015. Mm-hmm. She has been following you and dreaming of this day for her senior pictures. And that just like really showed me like I did that shoot in 2015 for the sole reason of I knew that would happen. Mm-hmm. And it took this long. <laughs> this was... so, so that's one thing. Like I have a very, I consider that my sales cycle. I have a long sales cycle. Meaning yeah. your first interaction with me, it is going to be two, three, five. We're at six years sometimes, mm-hmm. right? Of the, of the conversion to a client from my first interaction with you. And so that is something where be- because it is such a long game, my communication of that value is very passive. I'm not picking up a phone and talking to you and telling you why I'm the best person. Mm-hmm. It is, I always looked at where I was in the market as 
a luxury. And so oh, I was not out there copying other senior portrait photographers, business models or wedding photographer business models who had a really strong demand for their product. I felt like there is no demand. You don't wake up and say, I need romantic the course. So I looked at the boudoir industry because nobody wakes up and says, I need naked pictures of myself. You, it mm -hmm. is like a lust factor that yeah. people buy into as build it up in their head and be like, wow, I really want to experience that someday. So I look at my marketing and my sales from a very passive perspective of like me casting out that line mm -hmm. and luring you in very slowly. Yeah. And at the point that they come to me in my inbox, there's zero selling. Zero. Yeah. I send them the pricing. They pick the day. Bada bing, bada boom. Like all of the selling had been done. I'm never yeah. picking up the phone. I'm never communicating my value. I'm never walking them through what's in the packages. Send them the page online. And it's, I followed you for two years, three years, six years. Here. There's no question. I'm just take my credit card. <laughs> Here it is my money. And that's just. As a consumer, I like to be in control and I like to be educated. Do you like my nails missing? I should use this. <laughs> I like to be educated and I like to feel in control and I like to be the driver's seat. And so I feel like that's the way that I have structured a lot of my marketing to be passive. So I'm, I'm never overtly selling. It is a very passive marketing plan where... You feel in control mm -hmm. when you contact me and you're ready to book and you select your package and then your date on the couch. And to be completely transparent, that started because I was very busy working a ton of hours in that finance job and I had zero time for inquiries. I'm like, if you're going to send me an email, you better be a client. Right. The selling has to be done. Yeah. I don't have time to convince you why you need to spend this money on a one-to-one -one individual basis. And so that's how it started. And then it was just working so well for me that by the time I went full-time, even though now I did have that time to do that, and it really could have changed my situation, I just never stopped that same marketing strategy just because like, it had so much momentum at that point that right. the clients were rolling in and I didn't feel the need to change the strategy. So I feel what like that out of, I just have no time turn, just yes. turned into something different. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I think that it's super cool. And like the fact that you're able to do that is amazing. But I can't, I cannot convert cold, a cold call. So my Google SEO yeah. is great. And if somebody calls me off of Google wants it, wanting to book a session, I am like over 30, man. I, I cannot pick up a cold call and sell you on my session. And it doesn't happen. Yeah. Whereas I'm sure you would have a far better oh, yeah. thing, right? <laughs> converting a cold call on a right. on a phone call. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Like, and then he stumbles on me on Google and calls me. Not a chance to bet me. Not it. That's so funny. I think that's really important though, because like I had a client, I think it takes, I would say it takes five years at least of a solid, steady brand that is growing and out there in the putting yourself out there consistently for at least four to five years to get to that point. Because I feel like you have to plant those. I always say you plant your seeds and you throw a lot of seeds out. You said you cast a net. So you said you cast a net and you hopefully catch some fish. I say you throw a bunch of seeds out and hopefully a few of those seeds catch and grow into clients. And I have a client that I just photographed the other day. And I think she met me like three or four years ago at an event. And she talked to me three or four years ago. And when she called me this year, it was like, hey, I'm ready to do this now. I've been thinking about it for four years. And it was super easy, right? And I think that is a really important point in the beginning, like to make smart decisions, to plant the seeds and to cast your net out. And just really show up everywhere so that people know you and love you. And then once things start to fall, like that's when the magic happens in your business. Like 
a few years down the road when everything starts to fall into place and people just know you and they're like, oh, if we're going to do photos, we're going to her. If we're going to do photos, we're going to her. That's when the magic happens and things get so much easier. And then you're like, man, how did I market in this beginning years? That was rough. <laughs> so yeah, I love yeah. that. Well, a lot of hustle. I love that. And so I will share what I do when somebody contacts me. So when somebody contacts me, and the reason I do this is because I hate email. I hate email with a passion. Like literally I would do anything to not even have an email address. I would much rather check people on the phone. I think I'm really bad with my words typing. I'm really good speaking words, but typing them, I really struggle. So I get them on the phone. I talk to them. I tell them how it works. I walk them through the process. I tell them what most people invest. Like most people are investing at four to $5,000 mark at least. You could also spend $1,000. You could also spend $20,000 if you wanted to. It's totally up to you. We have options for everyone. And I just talk to them on the phone. It takes 10, maybe 15 minutes. Sometimes people like to tell me a lot about their courses and I get stuck on the phone for 30 minutes or an hour with someone because we know how worse people are. And I just talk to them. And that's my first point of contact. And literally, I do everything over phone calls or Zoom calls. I don't send any emails to my clients except for like their invoice and their link to schedule their reveal goes out over email. Everything else is done over phone or Zoom, which I think is really different than a lot of people. Most people are email heavy. Yeah, that's kind of what I do. This has been really fun. I feel like I've learned so much and it's really interesting because we are so different. Yeah, yeah, in the end, every aspect of this, we're but we're different. yeah, and I feel like the theme here is we're different, but what we do, we believe in, and it works for us. And we both are paid well, and we're not giving away the farm, and we're doing the best to hold up the industry that we're in. And I think that's really important for all of this, right? I think the only thing similar we have is probably that we both have a child, but we're very different, as you can tell by the backgrounds behind us, which I think is really ironic because like it's polar opposite what you're (laughs) seeing behind both of us on our readings, like bright and white and airy and dark and teal. and (laughs) So I love that. This has been really fun. I feel like we should do this again and talk about something else that's really different about us. We'll have to figure out what else is different about us. <laughs> and then I told my husband we were doing this and he goes, you should go photograph her and put her in a ball gown. <laughs> she should come photograph you later. She can dress you like she dresses for clients. I was like, that would actually be really funny. <laughs> okay. But now that I have a new pony, I'm going to need pictures of my new pony. So- I am so excited for you. I saw that you got a new horse. That's very exciting. Congratulations. Thanks. It was. And it, you bought your horse recently too, right? In the yeah, last couple of years. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I feel like it was really cool to be in a place because of my business that like this horse just happened to come up for sale. And I was like, hmm, man, I really don't think I want to miss out on this. I wasn't planning on buying a horse till next year, but have enough money in the business just to write myself a check and just go buy myself a horse and it was really cool it's a cool feeling like when your business allows you to do things like go buy yourself a fancy horse if you want to which is my goal for everybody be able to go make enough money to buy yourself a fancy horse (laughs) i guess maybe since we're so different too maybe we should tell Maybe you can share like what you do with your coaching stuff and like your classes and stuff and like how you do it. And I'll share how I do it too, since it's so different. And I think obviously, clearly we're going to attract different people there too. So I feel like that would be good. Yeah. So I had started separate pages for everything. Everything is KMP Learn. So on Instagram, it's at KMP Learn and Facebook, it's KMP Learn. The website's KMPLearn.com. I've been blogging free education since 2015 on there. So there is so much information if you peruse that blog and keep going through. There's three different free downloads and tons of free education on that blog. As for more resources, I have recorded courses. So they're on-demand videos. 
on a whole slew of topics, everything from working with natural light and editing and things with your camera to more heavily the business side of it, pricing, mm-hmm. marketing, advanced marketing, posing, welcome magazines, how to prepare your clients, all the above. There's a lot of different course there, or you can work with me one-on-one and that can be in Texas together face-to-face, or I offer virtual calls and coaching. If you don't want to come to the greatest state on earth, um, then we can meet virtually. But yeah, that is the education side of my business. Yes. So I, obviously, since I love IPS, I love teaching people how to do IPS and how to make money that way. But not in a cookie cutter way, in a way that works for what you love in your business. So a lot of what I teach to my coaching clients is finding your why, which allows you to be unique, figuring out how to price yourself to make money and figuring out how to implement an IPS system that works for you. So that's what a lot of what I do. And then also mindset. I love mindset and money. Like those are my two sweet spots because I found that so much of what happens in our business and our fears that rise up come from our mindset. So a lot of what I do with my coaching clients is our mindset and our money. And so my coaching stuff is called Master Your Mind and Money. And that's all we do. If you want to learn how to take beautiful pictures, go to Chris. Um, like that is her. She's so good at that. I like people ask me all the time, do you like, can you teach me how to take photos like yours? And I'm like, I could, but I just really like teaching people how to make money. <laughs> what is it? So yeah, that's how I feel about it. So yeah, I do one-on-one coaching and I do group coaching. So I'll be rolling out a new group coaching program after the new year. And then I do one-on-one coaching, which is what I really love because I love working with people one-on-one and well, getting to know everything about them, like getting to know all about their business, having you like call me and text me and celebrate when you have a client that finally books on your new pricing or all of those things. So I think one-on-one coaching is really cool. And I think that's I don't know. Did you ever do one-on-one coaching when you were with anyone when you were building your business? I have done group masterminds uh-huh. and, and I have not done any formal one-on-one coaching. I've had a ton of mentors. Like when I started this business, I worked for that wedding and uh-huh. her, so I was employed by her and learned so much. Yeah, that's um, true. And then just had peers in the industry where we informally have done a lot right. of helping each other. So the only like formal one was more group mastermind focused. Yeah. So I did, I was like a workshop junkie for a long time. I went to like every wedding photography workshop and like every, I went to like kids photography workshops. I didn't even photograph kids really. I was a workshop <laughs> junkie. And then I was like, workshops are boring. I need more help. So I started hiring like people one-on-one. So I found one-on-one is like when I made the biggest growth in my business when I did one-on-one, which was also scary because every time I was like, I don't believe them. They're crazy. This is never going to (laughs) work. So I was definitely that person that hired all the people in my business and it got me here much faster. And I'm sure like having good mentors that are above you, even if they're just in the industry or friends is super valuable because it's hard to do this business alone. Yeah, impossible to be for sure. You'll drive your spouse crazy asking him lots of questions about what should I do about this? Like, why don't you make some friends? <laughs> so, yes, I love that. So, this has been really fun. I'm glad we got to do this. And hopefully, everybody has gotten to see like total polar opposites here that are in the same market, do things differently. We yeah. both make good money for ourselves. And are crazy passionate about what we do and love what we do. And uh, hopefully like you can take some bits and pieces and like figure out where you lie in the scheme of things too as well. It was good talking to you and hopefully we can do this again sometime. All right. Oh, great.